Welcome to Game and Graphic, the show where we take a closer look at some of my and your favorite fictional environments from Mario to Mafia. Join me, Guinness Walker, on a journey of investigations, examination, and imagination. This video is brought to you by my wonderful supporters over on Patreon. By supporting the channel for less than $2 American a month, you can get early access to videos, the ability to download episodes, and nearly 100 original music tracks. A very special thank you to my executive producer tier patrons, Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Aussie, Die Castinator, Chuck K45, Miles Garrett, and King GTA 15. All of you are amazing, and your support is something I can't fully express my gratitude for. Thank you all so much. And this episode is brought to you in part by my executive producers, Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Chuck K45, and Die Castinator. You can check out Ezra's YouTube channel, Scott Games 99 where they play games such as NHL and MLB, and story-based games like the Red Dead Redemption series, with plenty more story-based games to come. Mason Collins' podcast channel, We're About Everything, where they discuss, well, everything from zombie apocalypses to game remasters and more. Chuck K45's channel, who's working on setting up a channel all about buying farm equipment, fixing it up, and starting a new farm from scratch, and Diecastinator's channel, where they examine, review, and discuss all things diecast, from the history of the hobby to rare models and much more, with new videos basically every day, in addition to buying, selling, and trading the diecast cars. All links in the description down below. Thank you to all of my patrons, and please consider signing up if you enjoy my content. Every little bit helps, people. Even if you can't support me financially, though, support the show by showing my executive producers some love. And without further ado, enjoy today's video. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Guinness Walker. You may know me from my web shows, such as Grand Theft Autobiographies or A Criminal History, but tonight, viewer, I'd like to take you closer to where some of the events I've covered in those shows actually happened. And where better to start than one of the most important and historical locations as it pertains to the history of America's most infamous criminals, Grove Street, or the neighborhoods of Ganton and Davis. Now the government will tell you there's no such thing as Ganton, that the area was always called Davis, and that those who remember differently are suffering from severe mental handicaps. But dear viewer, I am here to tell you, they are lying to you. I know, how could the government of this great nation do such a thing? How could the United States government lie to its own people? The very thought of it may make the more proud patriots among you vomit into the back seat of your four-door pickups, but I'm here to give you the truth, people. Not this nonsense that the networks are selling you. The real, honest, distilled, scripted and heavily editorialized, capital T, truth. And the truth is, it's all one big conspiracy. Now that Weasel has finally fired me for gross incompetence, I can give it to you straight without any corporate spin, and let me tell you how it is. Back in the mythical year of 1992, the area today known as Davis was known as Ganton, and while similar in many ways, the layout of the neighborhood in particular was completely different. What's more, Ganton was only considered a neighborhood of Los Santos, while the city of Davis was an incorporated city within the Los Santos metropolitan area. Ganton was impoverished, had a high crime rate, and was mainly residential while also being adjacent to a larger commercial area and having a few businesses within its own borders. To the east of Ganton was East Beach, territory of the East Side Vagos, and the silhouette of the Los Santos Forum Arena was an iconic part of the Ganton skyline. To the west, just over a set of train tracks, was the neighborhood of Idlewood, controlled by the gang the Ballas, who frequently fought with the main gang based out of Ganton, the Grove Street families, in both East Los Santos to the north and Willowfield to the south. In fact, for the residents of San Andreas and Los Santos especially, the name Grove Street is likely more immediately evocative of the eponymous gang rather than the actual street itself due to the gang's notorious association to the crash scandal and subsequent LA riots and their years of dominance over the city following the intense gang wars of the 1990s. If you want to know more about some of the key characters involved in those stories, you can check out my episodes of GTA Biographies on Carl Johnson, Melvin Big Smoke Harris, Lance Ryder Wilson, 
Sean Sweet Johnson, and Officer Frank Tenpenny. All links down below. For everybody else, allow me to very quickly summarize. Sometime in the 1980s, Sean Johnson, better known by his street alias Sweet, formed the Grove Street Family's gang, along with his younger brother Carl C.J. Johnson and friends Big Smoke and Ryder. The Grove Street families would fight for years with their rivals the Balas, and to a lesser extent the Mexican Vagos gang, while all three gangs dealt with the encroaching threat of corrupt law enforcement. Ganton had long been a holdout against the rise of crack cocaine on the streets of Los Santos due to Sweet's role as the head of the GSF, but by the early 90s this would culminate in violence and tragedy. At some point, one of the Johnson brothers would be killed, and another would move to the East Coast for five years, and during that time, Grove Street would lose much of their influence to their powerful rivals, the Balas. Eventually, the other Johnson brothers, CJ, would return from the East Coast, and over the course of 1992, help to re-establish Grove Street families as the city's dominant gang. Towards the end of 1992, however, the city, and Ganton especially, would experience a period of intense civil unrest and political turmoil, when the officers involved in the widespread crash scandal, officers Frank Tenpenny and Eddie Pulaski, were found not guilty on all charges. Following the verdict, the neighborhoods most affected over the years by Crash's abuse of power erupted with righteous indignation, and rioters began turning the streets of areas like Ganton into a scene straight out of a Vinewood thriller. Looters prowled from home to home, taking whatever they could get their hands on. Angered civilians lit police cars on fire in the middle of the street, and all across the city, gang wars erupted, as the Grove Street families used the riots as the perfect opportunity to make a clean sweep of their former territory, and re-establish their dominance. Eventually, the smoke would clear, and in the aftermath, it would be discovered that Frank Tenpenny had attempted to flee the city in a stolen fire truck, but after crashing it off the bridge overlooking the Grove Street cul-de-sac, Officer Tenpenny would be declared dead at the scene, and in the following hours, his body would be looted and desecrated by the remaining rioters. After this, my dear viewer, is where things get really confusing. Now, you already know what the government alleges, but now I'm going to reveal to you the truth. Sometime in 2008, suspiciously, right around the time of that financial crisis, all of us, including you, were transported into an alternate dimension. Similar in all of the ways that matter the most, but still distinctly different. Why won't the government discuss the completely contradictory layouts of Liberty City between 2001 and 2008? Why do some people say that San Fierro and Las Venturas used to be more directly connected to the mainland of San Andreas, and only separated by a narrow river? And why? Why is the only other person in the mainstream who seems to be fully aware of this enormous conspiracy, this guy? You'll let me on the show if I blow you? Uh, yes, and if you could wear some black lipstick, the little guy loves the goth vibe. It's all a bit too convenient and a bit too confusing, wouldn't you say? Well, I haven't got time to get into all the details, but for now, know this. I'm on to you. You can't hide the truth forever. 92 was year zero, JFK lives in Scotland with Janis Joplin, and we never even landed on the sun. Open your eyes, America. While strangely, it seemed as though the majority of historical events leading up to the shift appear to be the same, some of the names of individuals and locations appear to have changed dramatically, but nobody seems to really know the details anymore. Sometime after the OGs from Grove Street families secured control of their territory, it's rumored that many of them slowly moved on and perhaps became rich, successful entrepreneurs. With the dissolution of the original Grove Street gang, their rivals, the Balas, would step in to fill the void, and by 2012 they would have near complete control over much of Davis, including all of Grove Street, but would continue warring with the gang which served as the spiritual successors to the Grove, the Chamberlain Gangsters families, or simply the families. Much like in the 90s, though not nearly as intense, over the course of the 2010s, Davis would see a fair share of violence, thanks to the ongoing conflict between the two gangs, as well as both of their proximity to nearby neighborhoods like Rancho, controlled by the Mexican gangs like Farios Las Aztecas and the Los Santos Vagos. One particularly bloody and noteworthy shootout occurred sometime in either late 2012 or early 2013, when several unknown assailants, one of which was most definitely not me no matter what the people at Weasel or the government say, performed a drive-by shooting along Grove Street and other Balas-controlled areas of Davis, resulting in an untold number of deaths. 
Not long after that, also in 2013, another massive firefight would break out when a cocaine deal went sour between members of the Balas and members of the families. Allegedly, they were also accompanied that day by an out-of-place looking redneck who looked and sounded distinctly Canadian according to witnesses. Beyond unremarkable daily gang violence over the years, nothing particularly noteworthy would happen in Davis again until late 2021, when another brutal and newsworthy fight occurred once again between the DNF set of the families under Vernon and the OCB set of the Balas under a man named simply P. According to our sources, this particular conflict had actually been a misunderstanding, and amazingly resulted in the families and the Balas briefly working together afterwards to fight a common enemy in the north side Vagos. Alright y'all, you've seen the game, now let's look at the graphics. For this second half of the show, I'm going to break character and we're going to look at both of these areas in their proper contexts, as fictional neighborhoods in a video game which emulates the real world. Now, for those who are perhaps new to the Grand Theft Auto universe, or maybe never played the older games or just don't know, allow me to explain something. When Rockstar Games went about making Grand Theft Auto 4 in 2008, they had a problem that needed addressing. Do they recreate the Liberty City of GTA 3 and Liberty City stories and just expand it and bring it up to HD standards? Or do they take all that they'd learned in the years since originally creating LC for GTA 3 and create a whole new Liberty City unrestricted by what they'd done before? They chose the latter. What this means in practice is that everything that happened in the old games is gone, and a new history is established with the new games. A separation of eras was created. The games from GTA 3 up until the end of GTA Vice City Stories on the PSP were the 3D era, and everything after, including GTA 4, was the HD era. In practice, however, or rather, the way that I often think about it, all of the events of the old GTA games still happened, but they happened in different locations with different names, and maybe in some cases even different people. This is sort of kind of confirmed by characters like Jimmy in GTA 5 who very clearly reference events from San Andreas, despite other things like the completely different layouts separating the two universes as distinctly different from one another. Oh, and by the way, a very special thank you to the useful as always GTA Wiki, which is a fantastic resource for creating these kinds of projects. Definitely check out the wiki if you're interested in GTA lore and want to take an even deeper dive. Ganton was a relatively small, rectangular district with the Ellis River Basin on the east side and borders to rival gang territories all around it. For the most part, Ganton was a residential district, but there were also a couple of businesses dotted around, mostly closer to the train tracks and the neighborhood's southern border. There was the Ganton Gym, a barber shop, a bar, ten green bottles, as well as a Binko clothes store, all of which could be entered, in addition to a whole bunch of businesses that you couldn't enter like Liquor Mart, a 98 cent store, a pawn shop, and a laundromat. Back in San Andreas, it was also notable for being one of the few locations where you could find a basketball court, in this case right next to Sweet's house. Now, unlike the HD era versions, the streets are not named in Ganton other than obviously Grove Street, which technically extends well into Bala's territory in the nearby neighborhood of Idlewood. The whole area is really made up of just four streets. There's this avenue with the Ganton Gym on the corner, which has a series of townhouses to the south, one of which is where you meet Beat Up in the mission cleaning up the hood, and another is where you find LB's home invasion van for robbing places around Los Santos. At the end of this avenue is Denise's house, one of the game's girlfriends, and there's also a bridge leading north into East Los Santos. Then there are two roads going north-south which connect Ganton to East Los Santos and Willowfield, and of course Grove Street itself. Now let's jump ahead 9 years, or as far as the game is concerned, 19 years, since I'm using mods to view the game world as it exists in GTA Online at the time of recording which is just shy of GTA 5's 10th anniversary in September of 2023. Now, Davis is, as I said, very similar to Ganton, but distinctly different. For one thing, Davis is significantly larger than Ganton, with the area between Carson Avenue, Davis Avenue, Grove Street, and Roy Lowenstein Boulevard being about the same size as the original Ganton. The borders of Davis, however, are weird and crisscross around Innocence Boulevard, Davis Avenue, and Carson Avenue, with some blocks being half in Davis and half in Rancho or other neighboring districts. This is much like the real world city it's actually based on. Davis has its own city hall, courts building, firehouse, police station, mega mall, public library, and apparently, somewhere, a high school, though for game reasons you can't actually find the building anywhere. It also has many, many, many unique businesses, like a lot of neighborhoods in GTA 5, few of which you can actually enter, however. By the HD era, the store names hadn't completely lost their edge, but they had opted to be a little bit more realistic, often sounding like places that could actually exist, and maybe even be based on real-world locations in the real-world equivalent to Ganton slash Davis, which we'll get to shortly. So you get things like the Davis Mega Mall, 
Family Pharmacy, or Discount Depot sprinkled in among your dollar pills, lucky pluckers, and porn crackers. The Los Santos Transit Elevated Rail also has a stop in Davis at Carson Avenue between Bruges and Davis Avenue. But now that you've seen the fictional version, let's look at what all of this was likely inspired by. Now it probably comes as no surprise to you that Ganton, and by extension Davis, is based on the real-world city of Compton, California, which, like Davis, is an incorporated city in the greater Los Angeles metropolitan area. And as you also may know, Compton has a, well, a bit of a reputation on the global stage. The scope and scale of Compton's history is so massive and outside of my own realm of expertise that I won't even attempt to get into the details here. Instead, let's take a look at some of the city's most historical locations, at least from the perspective of a GTA fan. Now, in San Andreas, there aren't a whole lot of notable locations that can easily be given a one-to-one -one comparison, especially considering the time difference of nearly 30 years. In GTA 5, however, there are several locations that were very clearly inspired by very specific locations in the real-world city of Compton, such as the Compton Municipal Buildings and the Courthouse, the Compton Public Library, the Compton Fire Department Station No. 1, and what the GTA Wiki claimed was the best candidate for the real-world Grove Street, Spruce Street. The location and the name both suggest that this was the street which served as the inspiration for the team when initially designing Grove Street for San Andreas back in 2004. However, don't take their word for it. I scanned up and down Spruce Street in Flight Simulator, and I think I may have found the real-world Grove Street, and it is indeed at the end of Spruce Street. This cul-de-sac here isn't a perfect match, but it's a pretty damn close one. And its proximity to a nearby commercial zone is one more point in my favor, I think, especially when looking at the GTA 5 rendition of the area. And that's Ganton slash Davis slash Compton. I love it when developers create fake versions of real-world environments. I especially love GTA's take on this because of their established fictional version of America, which allows them to simultaneously have a lot of freedom to design while still staying true to the real-world analog, much like the Fallout franchise has done since Fallout 3. Grove Street and the neighborhood which surrounds it is one of the oldest and most important landmarks in my own personal history with video games as an entertainment medium. I thought where better to start than a place so important to both this channel and my own development as a gamer. A lot changed between 2004's rendition of Grove Street and its revival nine years later, but even more has changed in those nine years for the video game industry as a whole. Nine years, in those 19 years really. I hope we're just getting started here at Game & Graphic, which is a series that will not be sticking solely to the Grand Theft Auto franchise. We have many more worlds to discover and take a closer look at, and I hope you'll join me on that journey by subscribing, hitting the bell for notifications, and all that wonderful stuff. If you want to see these videos early and support the channel the best way that you can, consider signing up at my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Guinness Walker. I'll see you next time for another exciting dive into video game histography. I'm your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you.